Hi, I'm David Benjamin Tomlinson. You may know me as Linus from Star Trek Discovery, as well as a number of other aliens from across the galaxy. And you are watching Trek Untold. Hello and welcome to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. Star Trek Discovery has a lot of amazing aliens and a lot of amazing actors underneath those pounds and pounds of prosthetics that bring those creatures to life. It just so happens that the first time we met today's alien was when he had a little bit of some allergy problems. On this week's show, we're chatting with David Benjamin Tomlinson, who you may recall best as Linus the sniffling Starfleet Saurian who debuted in Season 2 Discovery, who has appeared in 11 episodes between his first appearance through Season 3 as of now. And it goes without saying, but I'm sure we're going to be seeing a lot more of Linus in Season 4 and beyond. Fun fact though, David has actually been in Discovery since Season 1, where he played two different Klingons in that very first season. He's also been a Kelpian in the Short Treks episode The Brightest Star and the second season Disco episode The Sound of Thunder, a brief stint as young Sue Call in That Hope Is You Part 2 from Season 3, and the Beetlejuicean named Cosmo Trait from part one of the season three premiere. We haven't seen David's human face in Star Trek yet, but luckily he's had plenty of other roles outside of Star Trek that required far less prosthetics, including Queer as Folk, Orphan Black, The Writer's Block, Designated Survivor, The Baroness Von Sketch Show, and many more. He's also had a tremendous career in theater and improv comedy, which we're going to chat a little bit about today, including one particular show that was very unique and one that I think you're going to really enjoy hearing about. Everybody loves Linus, so let's meet the man who has played the first story in Trek history since 1979, the diversely talented David Benjamin Tomlinson. But before we begin this week's episode, I want to remind you about the different ways that you can support Trek Untold. If you're in a position to help us financially, we have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash trekuntold, where you can support us for as little as $2 a month. Joining at higher levels allows you to have early access to the latest episodes, knowing in advance who our guests will be before anybody else finds out, or even the chance to submit questions to some of those future guests, and maybe your question might be heard on that episode. Shout out to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions, who create 3D printed toys and prop replicas inspired by Star Trek. Their items come in all shapes and all sizes and are always amazing, but you're going to hear a little bit more about them later on in the show. But most importantly, I need you to leave a review and rating on iTunes or wherever you're listening to Trek Untold. Five-star ratings and positive reviews help this show pop up when new listeners search for Star Trek podcasts and make sure that they know they're listening to something that is worth their time. If you're watching this episode in video format on YouTube, please leave a thumbs up, share the video, and of course, comment there as well. Interacting on all these platforms is a guaranteed way to spread the word about Trek Untold. So if you've been a fan of this show, please do take action in whatever way you can and help make sure that Trek Untold can reach more listeners just like you who are going to love this type of content. And don't forget to follow us on our social media pages, which includes Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. All you need to do is type in at Trek Untold on any of those platforms, search for us that way, and you will find us just like that. You can also watch the video version of this episode on our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to at youtube.com slash nerdnews today. The video versions are released on Sundays, so the audio version will always come first, but if you prefer watching it, that's the way to do it. We also do a lot of other Trek-related content there, including toy and book reviews and plenty of other stuff, so you might want to take a look too, just so you can indulge and get yourself a new daily dose of Trek nerddom, however way you like to get it. Now, without further ado, let's bring in this week's guest and get this episode started. Computer, beam in this week's guest. And welcome back to Trek Untold. And now join me on the other side of the screen. Today we are hanging out with Linus. We got David Benjamin <laughs> Tomlinson here. This is awesome. David, how are Hello. you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing awesome. I'm really excited to be speaking with you, the mind and the face behind Linus, the face we don't get to see as much. And uh, when I was doing my research for this episode, I didn't even realize you had actually had appeared a few other times on Trek before this. So you have yes. uh, quite a story here about this, but we'll get to that a little bit later on, I think. Uh, although I do want to bring up right now, you actually just did your first Star Trek convention uh, in Vegas recently. Yes. So how was that? Um, I think I'm still processing it. Uh, <laughs> I found it a very uh, a very emotional experience. Um, I'd never been to Vegas before, so that was a lot to take in. Um, but uh, uh, intersecting with the Star Trek community for the first time, uh, which I hadn't done up to this point, was... Uh, pretty profound. 
and uh, getting to talk to people about the show and about the character and uh, and being so welcomed that people kept saying welcome to the family. And I found that in, <laughs> like in this time when there's so much division, I just I just I, I was like, this is so beautiful. So it was a it was a pretty significant experience that uh, I'm going to I think my first you never forget your first so it will it will live live bright in my memory. And there's this stigma of the classic Trekkie, the super uber nerd who's just in your face and it's all horrible negative stereotype there but uh, you know firsthand having experienced I mean were you nervous about this were you nervous about yourself fitting in with this community and how did you feel just about the kind of folks you were meeting? I was Honestly, I was more worried because I can be very introverted and I was, I was, I hoped that I was going to seem friendly enough. <laughs> you know, I was worried that I was going to be too peopled out, um, but it, it didn't go that way at all. I, I just felt really engaged and welcomed and really at ease immediately. And so all of those weird mental stresses, which tends to be my like part of the way I work, I'll freak out about something beforehand and then it allows me to relax into it in the moment. And so uh, there was nothing overbearing. It was, uh, there was nothing abrasive. It was all, uh, it was all beautiful and it was all uh, affectionate and supportive. And uh, the diversity, the cosplay, the, the different iterations of, of, of costumes uh, and just the, the amazing conversation and the great artists that I met there too. Like, mm, it was, it was great. It's refreshing to hear that stars like yourself get nervous at these types of things because, you know, mind you, I'm doing this show and every time I talk to somebody, I'm always freaking out. I'm always nervous. So it's just very nice to hear that it's similar for you when you're meeting hordes of folks like me. Oh, I get very insecure. I get very worried, you know, like, but then you, you work it out like. I'm always, but I, that's kind of my thing, because when I perform live, like, you know, leading up to the second before I go on stage. Uh, it's all of this stuff and then the walk out from behind the curtain it all drops away and something else emerges i don't i don't look at the process too carefully i don't want to understand it i just know that it works enjoy the magic yeah so david let's just jump right on into things here i'd like to ask you the first question i ask all my guests here and that's what is your earliest memory of star trek Oh, easy. My first memory of Star Trek. Well, it's not easy. I, I remember uh, seeing moments and registering moments of the original series in my childhood, but my first sort of like concrete um, uh, exposure to the franchise and to the Star Trek universe was uh, the next generation. That sort of coincided with me being a teenager and and it, coming into my own and there was this pretty fantastic sci-fi program uh that was uh that gave me a place to, to to sort of like hang out with this crew that I admired so much I mean it's safe to say that you were a theater nerd and we'll get into that in a little bit but uh, were you also a little bit of a sci-fi nerd or was it just kind of like a fun Saturday afternoon kind of thing for oh you? no I was I was I grew up in a small rural uh, Ontario Canada town and Give me the setup. I, how small was it? <laughs> <laughs> it was so small you know what I don't even know it's bigger now uh I haven't been back there in, in a long time but like when I was growing up there was a general store a public school a post office a church and a fire hall and then sort of houses there was no uh if you needed uh, a big grocery store or you needed to go to high school or anything outside of the it was a, like a 15 minute drive to the, ne the next bigger town and I had uh, I had kind of like uh, I guess what we would call nerdy tastes growing up uh, so I was very into Doctor Who and I was very into Star Trek Next Generation and that's what that's where my attention gravitated you know I loved Unsolved Mysteries as well but it was it it, it, it was all in that sort of sci-fi unusual uh, in fact when um and I didn't know very many people who, I didn't know very many people who enjoyed the shows that I enjoyed. And, and so when Doctor Who regenerated, I had no idea about the legacy of the character or, or it was just a show that was on at like 7.30 and I watched it religiously. And when it was Tom Baker at the time and I loved his doctor and when he regenerated into Peter Davidson, I was like, what just happened? Like, and there was no one to talk to about it. The, so it was very frustrating, but with 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 the next generation, there was 
there was a more visible, there was more visible uh, people who you could sort of connect with people who watched it and discuss what happened. And so it was very much uh, destination programming for me. Now, were your parents in the creative field or were they doing something completely different, something far removed from what you're doing today? They were doing something very far removed from from what I'm doing today. Yeah, my dad would enjoy watching the occasional sci-fi or, or thriller adventure thing with me, but they're they're not very nerdy, my parents. They're, you know, they're not very, uh, they enjoy it, but they're not, you know, I fell pretty far away from the tree, uh, this apple did in that regard. I always like hearing from the guests what their parents did for a living. I mean, what, what, if you don't mind telling us, what were their occupations? Um, that's a really good question. My dad, uh, I believe he worked for, uh, no, he did work. I was just never clear on what he did. Uh, it was, uh, he worked at IBM. And so he was like a, in human resources and sales and, and that kind of thing. And my mom uh, was very busy raising four children. And, and uh, she also was an aerobics teacher for a while. And uh, so she had her hands, hands full, uh, but uh, not, not nerdy people, for sure. Now, were you always interested in being an actor or did you want to be something else when you were growing up? I knew that I was very creative uh from very early and i started to um express myself in really creative ways uh when i was young and um so it was something that was always with me and as i got a little bit older i, I felt very pulled by the stage and uh, the idea of performing and and also i was a i wrote a lot even as a kid just like you know like three ringed papers like binders jammed full of paper i it's just uh, something i've always done so i knew i was a very creative person uh and it just took me a while to sort of figure out how to articulate it and how to express it and what i was doing but it always felt like uh creativity is is sort of my great faith now did you go to university to continue in the arts or do you dabble in something else i I went after high school, I went to university and I took, I was unprepared, uh, unprepared to sort of declare what it is that I wanted to do. So I took a very general arts uh, program. But the great thing about the program was it allowed me to take a little bit of like theater history and performance and poetry and uh, uh, English. And so I, I got this really amazing varied foundation uh, it's creatively speaking that sort of was the foundation upon which everything else was built i was i mean a big part of of going to school and and coming to terms with uh myself as a creative person was also at that time i was really uh i was struggling with uh my sexuality and i was i was struggling with uh, having feeling like I needed to come out or wanted to come out. I didn't even know what that looked like. And so I, I wasn't, I, I didn't, I didn't really think at that time that I could do the things that I wanted to do because I felt so negatively about myself. So that time is also, when I think about it, that sort of version of me is, is, is not terribly confident in themselves or what they can do because they're feeling incredibly conflicted. So it's tricky, but I kept I kept the creative tether going. That was definitely a through line. I mean, during this very formative time in your life, you're trying to figure out your identity, trying to figure out who you are. At the same time, you're basically intaking a whole ton of information from different people. Uh, was there like one particular teacher or even just maybe like one lesson that you remember learning that has stuck with you today and it's something that you still use to this day? Yes, uh, there are. There are definitely there are, are moments that I've had with teachers where light bulbs uh, in in me uh, uh, went off. I had a teacher. Her name was uh, Miss Adele, and she was my grade thirteen teacher at a time that there was grade thirteen in in uh, here in Ontario. And we had to read a short story called "Repent, Harlequin," said the TikTok man, which was, do you know it? Yep, yep. It's it's a great story. Uh, and we had to talk about it. And when it came time to talk about the story, she stood at the front of the class behind her desk and she, we got to discussing the part about, uh, I, you're gonna have to refresh my memory because this, this piece is, is, is very distant. At some point he releases something from a ship in the sky and it's raining down like candy or colors or, or something towards the end of the story. And she had 
uh, behind her desk, this bag of candies. And she just started chucking them uh, as we read this, as this section was being read aloud, she just, uh, she just started throwing the, the candies at the class and everyone started screaming. And it was this uh, incredible moment. And she sort of brought what the character was doing in the story to life in such a visceral way. And it just, uh, uh, it just in that moment was like, this is how powerful storytelling can be. This is how powerful creative uh, creativity can be in terms of, uh, like just being so alive, that moment is so alive. And, and as a creative person, I witnessed that. And I was just like, wow, this is so exciting and so powerful. And it's, it's, it's not the conventional way to do it. And there's a real power in the unconventional. So it was very much the performative art of what you were reading that really. Oh, very, yes, you know, now we, you're gonna see, you're gonna help me analyze all the stuff <laughs> that I haven't analyzed with it. Yeah, so I, so I was enjoying the, bringing the words to performative life and, and not really resonating with me. Yes, that's perfect. That's I charge perfect. by the hour. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is kind of a perfect segue to also discuss something else I found out about you, and that's uh, you've done some sketch comedy, you've done improv, mm -hmm. and I'd like to hear how those things came into your life. Uh, creative flow. I it, it's been such a curious and fascinating journey. I I was uh, mid twenties, and I had I'd finally come out, and I was I was figuring myself out, and I was working at a credit office. Um, just doing weird handyman kind of things. And uh, everyone kept saying how funny I was and that I should need to go take an improv class. And, and I was just like, yeah, that's, that's something that I've always, that interests me. Like there's this performer inside of me, but I just, again, I just didn't have the confidence. And so finally I signed up for an improv class and I went and I remember standing outside the building that the class was in and it was like 15 minutes before the class and I just stood there and I was like paralyzed. I just like, I didn't know if I could go in. I was so scared of what I, I don't know, but I was just, and I forced myself to go in and within 10 minutes, I was like, oh my goodness, I've been doing this my whole life and nobody has been playing back with me. And I felt like I had come home. And then I just, the performer in me exploded. So I like, I just took every improv class that I could. I started performing all over the place and improvising all over the place. And I really got my performance legs. And it was this fast and furious progression. And at the same time, of course, I started, uh, my writing kind of went into a sketch comedy direction because that's kind of the world I was living in. And so out of improv came sketch. And I, I was part of the first uh, queer Canadian sketch duo called Glyph and we traveled all over the country. And, and then, uh, so we I did that for a while. And then out of that came, uh, I started to feel cons constraint. Uh, because I started wanting to explore more serious things as well. And sort of the world of comedy seemed like uh, it didn't want to give me the, the room to do that. So I kind of defected over to theater and started writing short plays. And so like, it's, it's just always unfolding. And then I started writing longer plays and then I started working on longer scripts and writing bigger shows and then these different acting opportunities and and then Linus, you know, after after a long time of and and all of these, the fascinating thing about Linus, Linus, uh, all of these different things that I've studied along the way, uh, all of these different weird performance modalities that I've experimented with and and gone through, it's like this created this very weird intersection, and somehow Linus like sits in that intersection. He's like, oh, this is this is the piece that brings all of this weirdness together in this magical way. I think it kind of is a weird segue, but a good one into uh, this question here. Let, let's see if maybe this, maybe this can be part of Linus and Giorgio's story, but uh, I've read sure. about something you did, and this uh, kind of also goes into Glyph a little bit, I think. Uh, you did a, a show called Blind Date at the Centaur Theater, and yes. that sounded like such a cool concept, and uh, you came into that and basically changed the format of it. So can you tell us a little bit about what Blind Date was and what your contribution was to that, and just what this whole show is? It's, it's very intriguing, really cool show. It's a fascinating show. It was created by uh, a friend of mine who is an improviser uh, whose name is Rebecca Northern. And it, that's a show that experienced uh, a growth process as well. It started off as like a 10 minute bit and expanded to a full show and it's played to sold out houses all across the country. It's been in, uh, very popular. 
in the in the sort of regular version of the show, Rebecca plays a French clown whose name is Mimi. And uh, she selects a member of the audience uh, to be her date for the evening. And over the course of an hour and a half, they improvise this date together. And there, the show works in a way that there are sort of like chaptered sections. So it has a, a little bit of a structure, but really it's about uh, anything can happen at any time, but it's as an audience member and having watched the show countless times, it's hard for me actually to talk about the magic of the show without getting weirdly emotional because I find it so <laughs> profound, but it's like, you get to see someone uh, settle into themselves and we get to see just like this really simple, beautiful act of people connecting in the guise of all of this silliness and fun. And it's, it's, it's quite a brilliant, uh, magical piece of theater. And Rebecca is remarkably skilled at performing it. And a number of years ago, uh, the queer theater in Toronto that I have done a lot of uh, work on uh, at over the years, I uh, named Buddies in Bad Times. Uh, they, uh, the Buddies and Rebecca started a conversation about what would a queer version of the show look like. And Rebecca said, um, the one thing I know is I would want David to, to be the gay male clown. And uh, everyone was on board. And so I got this beautiful opportunity to come in and work with uh, buddies and Rebecca in terms of sort of queering the show and taking a look at the things that in queer culture versus straight culture that didn't translate the same way and find the new jokes and humor and create this um, another really remarkable character whose name is Mathieu, who selects the audience member and, and goes on this crazy date. And it's, uh, it's, it's, some of, it's some of the work some of the work I've done in that show and the experiences I've had in that show are some of the most beautiful performance experiences of my life so far. And that sounds like a very intimate kind of challenge to do. I mean, to do that every night. I mean, how does one of those shows shape up? How does a show like that actually function? How do you make that kind of thing happen? Because you're basically doing that with someone who has no idea what's going to come next with what you know it's scripted. Uh, and then there's, of course, a whole lot of improv elements. So basically, how do you get this total stranger from an audience to come up there with you, go on a blind date with you, but then also make sure that you're getting to tell the narrative that's part of the story in there. Well, I mean, the narrative is the thing that emerges between uh, me and the date. And so uh, when before the show starts, the clown mingles with the audience member in the lobby, chatting with people, checking in for willingness, looking for people. Do you know, like uh, when we're asked about this and, and all of the people who have played the clown in this show, uh, we all agree that um, if you're at a cocktail party, you know, and suddenly the person that you're with gets pulled into another conversation and you're looking around the room for someone to talk to and you're you like and then you find someone by the hors d'oeuvre tray and, and they have a special shine and you're like, yeah, I could talk to you all night. We're, that's the kind of energy we're looking for in the lobby. And when we we find when we get that kind of vibe with sort of like an interest and a willingness to participate, that's how we choose the person the date unfolds very much like this interview. Like we've never met before, but we are through questioning and answering and talking, we are forming a relationship and a story. Um, and that's, and you have your pre-written questions, but at, at any time I could say something that we go in a completely different direction or, or you pivot and, and go somewhere you weren't expecting. And the show works in exactly, the, exactly that way. So there's a loose structure, like there's kind of like, uh, one, two, three, four kind of chunks, but any one of them can change in a weird uh, or, or wonderful way uh, at any moment based on what the date uh, suggests uh, because it's all improvised. And there's a, a team of people backstage if the date wants to go somewhere um, besides some of the locations that we have available, then we just make it happen. The team makes it happen in an instant. And so that uh, that to me is also part of the magic of the show that someone can make a suggestion and like, uh, you know, instead of, well, let's go to this place and they'll say, well, why don't we go to this place? And then I'll hear the furious sound of feet pounding backstage and, and, and people getting props. And then I know that when we get there, it's going to be there. And like, and so, so I don't know, like all I know is one of my favorites was um, somebody decided uh, on, in one of my shows, the date, we were going to go, uh, we were going to go to an apartment and hang out. But then when we got, uh, when we were on the way, uh, they said, oh, you know where I'd like to go? I'd like to go to the parking lot of a nuclear power plant near where I live. 
And I was like, uh, I, you know, the clown's French. So he was like, oh, why would that be, you know? And so it turns out that he had kissed a girl in that parking lot. They went there to make out and it didn't go well. And he's like, I want to go there and make the moment right. So I said, fine, let's go there. And sure enough, you heard the pounding of footsteps. And, and when we ran to the corner, they had sort of set up a makeshift car and they support characters. And it was and that's the that's the sort of that kind of theater that's so dynamic and so immediate and so spontaneous. It's a, it's a very special kind of magic. And there's a real delight in the audience and a delight in the date and a delight in the in the clown that this is all coming together. It's it's really beautiful. I mean, there's immersive and there's blind date because that's <laughs> yes. and no one you no one's forced to to participate if they don't want to a lot of people want to sit and watch the show and that's totally fine like we only you know and uh it's 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 a beautiful thing to watch that show now if you don't mind me digging here super personal i'm just curious uh were you out first as david the person or david the professional do you know what happened uh when i finally i came out personally first and after being feeling closeted for so long, uh, shortly after I came up personally, I started improvising. I remember, oh, and this is another, this is another teacher moment. I was in an improv class and I was improvising and I was on stage with a, a person in the class who anytime uh, that he and I would improvise together, everyone else would just sit back because we would just go on like a 10 minute scene tear. Like we were just brilliant together. Uh, and this scene, um, I improvised a scene where my character was was gay. And um, it, w- it turned into kind of a somber, thoughtful scene that was like really lovely. And at the end, the my teacher, whose name was Moira, came over and she said, what you did just now, that was really powerful and you should consider doing more of it. Because at that time, there were no gay improvisers or queer improvisers uh, doing it. And um, in fact, a lot of sketch comedy was ending on blow lines of, you know, but he's a fag, you know, and the lights would come out because that was the joke and that was the culture at that time. And so it felt like after all of these years of being in the closet, um, I had to be myself professionally and personally 100%. And that meant representing on stages and comedy clubs and, uh, and, and everywhere. So yeah, it, it was like a one-two punch for me and uh, I never regretted it. It made things difficult, but I don't ever regret it. Now, I'm not necessarily asking you to be the spokesperson for LGBTQ matters here, but you right. know, a lot of times in media today, you have the haters out there who are saying, oh, these people, they're flaunting their sexuality and they're showing it off to impressionable youth who shouldn't have to see this when there's like a gay character that shows up in something or a non-binary or a trans character like we've got a sure. non-binary in Star Trek. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what's your response to those kinds of haters saying those types of things? I have a very weird response uh, to it. I call it the cauliflower paradigm, which is... I don't know, which is basically, uh, I'm not a cauliflower fan, right? And I've got a lot of friends who think cauliflower is amazing and and they're like, oh, I'll make you cauliflower and you're gonna love it. And I never really do because it's just not to my taste. So you can show me cauliflower in any number of ways, but it's not to my taste. So I can sit at a dinner table and there can be cauliflower. And I know, you know what? I, I know from experience, that's not to my taste. And so I, for the people who are so terrified uh, that watching two men kiss on TV is going to turn their son queer, I just, I'm like, it's the cauliflower paradigm. If it's not to their taste, it's not something they're going to reach for. But I'll tell you what, if they say two, if they say, if they see two men kissing on TV when they're nine uh, and they're asking themselves some pretty sobering questions at 15 and 16, maybe seeing that and seeing that representation and seeing that moment is going to stop them from killing themselves or, or hating themselves or, or knowing that there's a place for them somewhere in the world and that will give them hope. So I'm just like, for me, it's a bit ridiculous. Uh, Like it's a bit ridiculous. It's for me, it's the cauliflower thing. That's my response. So that makes sense. I know it's it's a weird, it's a weird. That's a really weird way to put it, but it actually makes a lot of sense how you put it. And you're right. You never know who's watching. You never know who's listening. And what you might do one day might save someone's life. That's a good way to put it. Oh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you this. I was um, I was improvising uh, early on, and uh, we started improvising a musical, which um, was one of my favorite things to do. I loved improvising musicals. I loved it, and. Uh, 
there, I forget why, but two people started about how wonderful it is when a man and a woman have have sex. And so I, I walked out in the middle of the musical number and I started talking about, but it's also okay if two guys get together or whatever and turn the song queer. And the audience went bananas. Uh, and a good like clapping and cheering. And I found out afterwards that there were, were um, a group of queer teens from like Alberta who had come into Toronto to check out improv and to, uh, and they saw this moment and their minds were blown that someone would do that on stage. And I didn't know that they were there. And so uh, to know that they would be armed with the seeing that they now have the courage to do that and represent and show up. It's like, we need to show up for each other, you know? And, and that, that moment uh, had a pretty huge impact on me in terms of the importance of showing up and how we show up. And... Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. Ranging from prop replicas to use in a fan film or cosplay, to accessories or playsets for figures in all different sizes, Triple Fiction Productions has got you covered. Past pieces for toys have included large centerpieces like 10 Forward from the Enterprise D, shuttle crafts complete with working lights, and the Voyager Bridge, with smaller pieces including Borg alcoves, the Genesis device, and the dreaded arch enemy of Worf, barrels. All highly detailed products are 3D printed and hand painted in the USA, with new items added all the time while simultaneously improving their printing quality based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit triple-fictionproductions.net or visit them on Facebook at facebook.com slash triplefictionproductions. Want to get 10% off your next purchase? Use code UNTOLD10 at checkout to receive this discount. Not applicable during sales or clearance events. That's code UNTOLD10 to get 10% off action figure dioramas, accessories, and prop replicas. Triple Fiction Productions, taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. Hi, I'm Jonathan Frakes. If you're of a certain age, you may remember me as Commander Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation. And my wonderful brother Daniel died with pancreatic cancer 24 years ago. They opened him up, they diagnosed, they said, you've got six months to live, and that was it. He died four months later. And at that time, there was a 3% survival rate. Since then, we've grown to the embarrassingly high number of 10%. But a dear friend of mine and probably all of yours, Kitty Swink, is one of those 10%. She has survived pancreatic cancer for 17 going on 18 years. Pancreatic cancer is the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States with a five-year survival rate. That's just 10%. And more than 60,000 Americans are estimated to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2021. More than 48,000 will die from the disease because symptoms are often vague and be hard to detect. That's why I'm supporting the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, the leading patient advocacy organization committed to fighting the world's toughest cancer. PanCan is working hard to create outcomes for this devastating disease through its groundbreaking research in early detection and better treatment options. PanCan drives progress by funding life-saving research, providing personalized patient services, and creating a community of supporters and volunteers like you who will stop at nothing to create a world in which all pancreatic cancer patients will thrive. You can help support our important mission by donating today at pancan.org. Thanks for your time. We now return to Trek Untold. All right, so David, let's jump into our Star Trek discussion. Uh, now, you played a Klingon on Season 1 of Discovery, uh, multiple Klingons, in fact, which mm -hmm. was really cool to learn about. I didn't even realize that. That's the fun thing about prosthetics. Uh, yes. So yeah, tell us a little bit about what Season 1 of Disco was like for you. 
Um, I would say it was trial by fire. When I think about season one, it was um, learning to perform inside a prosthetic. I'd never done prosthetic work prior to Star Trek and I'm really excited to try it and super stoked to uh, be a Klingon and on Star Trek and work with some of the finest uh, prosthetic artists uh, on the planet. Uh, and also I'm on a giant set and there are, <laughs> there are a lot of things about wearing a prosthetic that I did not see coming. And so it was very much a, uh, a trial by fire of having to figure this out really fast. And then at the same time, like having moments where I'd be standing like on set and I'd be like, I'm a Klingon right now. Like I'm a Klingon. Like it was so exciting. It was uh, so, and uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, so so season one, sort of, I learned a lot. It was very intense. It was very hard because I had romanced prosthetic work uh, a long time. Anytime growing up, that they showed like behind the scenes on the the videotape or the 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 DVD or now the Blu-ray or, or now it's digital, I guess. Uh, but like you know, they'd show the actors getting their head cast. I'm like, oh, that looks so cool. I want to know what that's like. And then wearing a prosthetics. So when I when I got the opportunity to do it, I was like beyond excited. Um, and the, I, I feel like it's, it's a, it's a line of work that's easy to romanticize. It's like, it's so cool. It'd be so exciting and, and interesting. And, and all of that is a hundred percent true, but there's another piece to the work that I don't think is talked about a lot, which is, is just the fact that you kind of, there's a, a psychological piece of, of coping with being uncomfortable and uh, like dealing with the fact that you're not seeing and hearing correctly. And that creates a stress and not focusing on how uncomfortable you are. And so there's like a lot, there's a big sort of psychological maintenance piece that people don't talk about. And I feel like once I figured that out, like once you make discomfort your friend in a prosthetic, then you get on the other side of it and you find the play. Uh, and and find where all the joy and delight is. But you have to navigate that sort of like discomfort piece. We've spoken with several other actors who have been on Discovery who have had done very heavy prosthetic roles and they've had all sorts of things that they've learned from Doug Jones in particular. Uh, so I'm curious what you've learned from Doug. Let's talk maybe season one. I don't know if you had a chance to talk them much during season one, but uh, what, what are some lessons you've learned from Doug about working in the prosthetics? Uh, and then also maybe, uh, I guess we'll take a step forward. Uh, what has he taught you about working in the prosthetics and also about finding your character under the prosthetics? Doug is amazing. Doug has been a remarkable mentor and a wonderful friend and an incredible ally on set. And he has provided, uh, he's always ready. If I have a question, I'll check in with him about something and he always has an answer. So he's he's incredible that way. He is Absolutely incredible. And he, and uh, so he, there have been little pieces of learning along the way and not all from, not all from Doug. So season one, trial by fire, Klingons, uh, very intense, exciting, very challenging, learned a lot. And we get into season two and we have Linus. And the first, the first uh, time I was, went to set for, uh, we did a camera test for Linus and I saw the prosthetic on the counter in the prosthetics trailer. And I was like, oh my goodness, he's, He's gorgeous. He's gorgeous. And we put it on and we went, they took me to the bridge because they wanted to film uh, uh, me again on a set to see how the lights, how it worked with his eyes. And James McKinnon, who was the head of pros uh, prosthetic department at that time. Uh, so I was like sort of orienting myself and, and figuring out the feel of the mask. And, and James came over and he whispered in my ear, he said, uh, don't be afraid to drive the prosthetic. And that was a huge penny drop moment for me because I was like, right, it's like a dress. It's like, don't let the outfit wear you. You have to wear the outfit. So, I, so it, it, you know, you can twist the head. You can, you can find the language. You can, you can do the work behind the prosthetic to really bring it to life and really punch it forward. Uh, I had a great piece of advice from Doug in season two. I was playing in episode six, I was playing a Kelpian on a beach and I was, I had to stride across the beach with my ganglia in my hand and, and ask my sister what had happened. And so I had to do this, uh, it, those, those unbelievable boots 
that uh, the Kelpians have to wear. So I'm managing that on the sand and the sun is in my eyes and I'm, I have to land on this spot and then in the sand, keep my balance and have the ganglia and the sun and, and, and everything just felt like it was working against me. And I said to, we, Doug and I were talking at the end of the day and I said, um, God, it just felt like today, um, uh, it was everything I could do just to transcend the, all the challenges. And he said, my boy, that, that, that describes my entire career. And I was like, oh, bang, that's a huge piece of it too, is that the job is you are constantly transcending the challenges in your way. There's never going to be a day that you aren't uh, feeling handcuffed in some way because you can't, you don't have your sight or you don't have your hearing in the same way or you know, you've, your balance is off. Like there's, there's always something to transcend. And that was another huge piece. Those are two. There's more. Let's see if we can refresh your memories to go along, maybe. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure they'll pour out. They're, they'll pour out. But um, being on set with Doug. Uh, uh, oh, and this is this is something else I've I've learned too. Um, being on set with Doug, I think we were both always excited when we're on set together because it means that there's someone else holding the same kind of space. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, we're, when we're on set together, we both know what the other person is experiencing and when someone is sort of in that experience with you it just makes your shouldering of the experience lighter because you're not alone and so when we're on set together it's always wonderful because there's so much support and love and sometimes that looks like just sitting quietly together um sometimes uh we're laughing or hugging or whatever but um it's, it's just it's just lovely to be in the room with someone who's dealing with all of the stuff that you're dealing with it's a pretty powerful pretty powerful thing yeah. One of these days, I got to get the courage to just send Doug an uh, Instagram message and see if he'll respond. I got to get him oh. on the show one of these days, but that's that's a future problem for future Matthew to deal with. Uh, but let's take a step back in the past real quick. And I want to learn actually how the part of Linus came to be for you. Because like we said, season one, you were a Klingon. You've done some work as a Kelpian. You've also been a Beetlejuicean. I think that's how you say that. Uh, and yeah. now you're a Saurian. So yeah. uh, how did you end up becoming cast as Linus? You know what? Uh, that is a question I get asked a lot and I don't have a great answer. I literally uh, opened my email uh, and it was from my agent and she had forwarded a letter from production and it said, you know, hello, uh, we're excited to have David back for, for this season. We'd like to offer him the role of Linus the Saurian. I had no idea what a Saurian was. Uh, I was like, what does this mean? Like, what does this mean? It was sort of like, you know, here's this thing and transmission. There was, there was nothing more. So I immediately was like, oh, what? What is it? What a great name. What is this? <laughs> so I found out about the Saurian in Star Trek, the motion picture. Um, and uh, I would looked at that prosthetic. I was like, ooh, he, you know, it's going to be, it's going to look interesting. Nothing prepared me for how they updated the look of the prosthetic. And when I finally saw him, I was like, oh, man beautiful so i don't know what i fate fate something special a certain kind of magic i don't know but i'm really grateful that it, uh, he came my way i think we all are because uh yeah i mean linus would be nothing without you in the pilot seat if you will um <laughs> but yeah as you mentioned i mean i'm glad that you did look up whatever little bit there was about the saurians because there's nothing really about them besides their single appearance in the motion picture and like maybe some books or something right well um, they, they have four hearts uh, which makes them great uh, for, uh, I mean, and this is stuff I've picked up. I don't even know if it's considered canon. I feel because they figured in a video, is it a video game that I read? Anyway, the Brandy thing. So there isn't a lot. So I'm, so I was very conscious that I was going to be contributing to canon in, in an important way. And that, I, that became a challenge too. That became a challenge too, because I became, I was like, oh my goodness, once the thrill of, I, I get to go back to work and I'm going to, I'm going to be this character then became the terror of, Oh my goodness, I'm going to be now <laughs> contributing to Canon in a way. And I want it to be informed. And so I started overthinking and I, I worked with a movement coach who, who uh, was very uh, sort of like a, a great foundational piece. And I watched a ton of sort of reptilian reference footage and picked up a few things. And uh, when I actually, when I got to set, to shoot the elevator scene. It was the first time that I'd been on set as Linus and everyone was delighting in the prosthetic and everyone was marveling at how, because he he looks a certain way uh, on camera, but to see it in person is just, 
he's beautiful. Uh, and I was so stressed out and I was still, I couldn't put this idea down that I like, I it's like, because I take my job very seriously. And again, this, remember the overthinking I was talking about earlier. So this is, this is me. I was just like stewing and, and as an actor and a performer, uh, overthinking is like how you kneecap yourself, right? You, you, you can't let that stuff get in the way. And I was like freaked out and we got into the elevator and, and, uh, uh, so we rehearsed it, uh, Burnham, Burnham got into the elevator and she asked Linus, you know, how is your throat? And no one had talked with me about the noise you should make. So I just had come up with the noise that I made and I just made a, like a Wah! but through the prosthetic, it sounded really weird. And in that moment, Sonequa looked at me and her eyes kind of woo got out of her head. And then she said, oh man, it is gonna be a long night with this one. Cause it was like one in the morning and they'd been working all day. And I just kind of sailed in at like that evening and was finally on set and everyone was laughing. And then I felt Doug's hand on my shoulder cause it was like this wonderful moment of delight. And in that moment of ease and laughing and comfort I just heard this voice uh, at the back of my head. Uh, and it said, uh, oh, I, I know what this is. I've got this. And it was kind of like the line is like all of the thinking parted and the energy of Linus kind of came down. And then it was just like, OK, perfect. Like, again, stepping up from behind the curtain and then all of the thinking goes away. And then you're sort of in the sort of the the expression of the character. And would you say that that was the moment that Linus kind of clicked for you mentally and physically or, or did something else happen before or after that where it kind of came together and, and assimilated into you? That is the moment. That is the moment that all of the different pieces, all of the all of the research and the movement stuff and the the uh, little bits of information and posture stuff that I took, like all of the detailed work that I had done kind of just like slammed together and evaporated. And then I was suddenly left with this energy. And when I, if, if there's a moment on set that I kind of feel like, oh, I've, I just, I have a posture that I go back into to, to find him. And then I'm like, okay, there, there it is. And so that's, that's my go-to. So having done several different aliens now also, we can kind of speak to this as a whole, but uh, can you tell yeah. us a little bit first about what the makeup process is for Linus, how long you're sitting in that chair, and how does that compare to the other aliens you've played on Discovery so far? Linus is two hours in the chair, and then at night, depending how much I've sweat uh, and how hot I've been, it can come off 20 minutes to like 40, it depends, it depends on the day. Um, the, the the great thing the thing that I the thing that I love about the Linus prosthetic is uh, well I'll, I'll explain the prosthetic so the prosthetic uh, is made up of several different pieces uh, the first is a cowl so the cowl sits on my head and my shoulders and it has the face cut out so that's sort of glued down and then there's a pair of uh, goggles that go on here that act as a support for the face but also as a thing for the eyes to fit into and 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 hold, and then the face goes on, and then the mandibles go on, and then the jaw goes on. So that's how the prosthetic works. And the thing, the great thing about the Linus prosthetic is that uh, there's nothing around the eyes. With like Klingons or Kelpians, you have to blend the prosthetic right around the eyes, and that can be very tedious some days, uh, or, or like like get uncomfortable. But with Linus, I'm, I'm spared with that. I, I also have a little bit of like space around my eyes that there's like, a bit of air and space it's not i'm not like sealed completely in so uh i'd say that the klingon prosthetic was probably the toughest prosthetic that i've worn it was the heaviest and it required a lot and again like i'm grateful for that experience because the experience of being a klingon kind of paved the way for it was like this is the work you're going to do this really really tough job with this prosthetic and they were beautiful, and I, but they were big. Like I had to wear a bowl on my head to support the back of the Klingon head. There was a lot going on and it was like right to the eyes, but it looked gorgeous. Um, uh, and Linus feels very sleek to me. The Beetlejuicean uh, was, I think he's a foam latex prosthetic. So he's a slightly different, made out of casil uh, Linus's silicone. And because the whole energy of that character was kind of down or, or like frumpy and he had like a, they gave him a pot belly. Um, so I, so, it, and his face kind of like, there were all those bags under the eyes. So like, there was like this, 
it was a psychic weight, but uh, I feel like Linus is the most graceful of of all of them. I don't know. I just wandered there, but is that is that the answer? <laughs> uh, that's, if, if that, that sounds like the answer to me. I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. I gotta great. ask you too. You know, as a fan of Star Trek, growing up watching the show, was there any kind of reaction for you the first time you got to put on a Starfleet uniform? It's just surreal. It's just surreal. I didn't see the discovery side of things in season one. So when I got to the discovery side uh, and walked on, uh, walked in that hallway for the first time and looked at the bridge and, you know, looked at the, uh, the med bay for the first time, I, you know what, you know what almost made me cry? Or actually, no, I, I'll be completely honest with you. Uh, you know what made me cry? <laughs> um, so, Linus, I shot something in the second episode of season two that didn't make the episode. Um, and Jonathan Frakes uh, was the director of that episode. And so I didn't meet Jonathan beforehand. I just uh, met, like I just was sitting in my chair with my Linus on and Jonathan walked in and said, ah, you're, you're Linus. And uh, so we chatted and then he sat down across from me and he leaned forward in his chair and he kind of locked me in his sights and he said, welcome aboard and like no one can see my eyes because i'm wearing the linus's eyes but like i've got tears because there's a lot of there's a lot of significance like going back to that 16 year old kid watching Riker on tng and 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 being a fan of of the show and then now here in this reality i'm in this lizard head and here's jonathan frakes welcoming me aboard and i'm on set like it was a very powerful moment um, and it was, uh, it was, yeah, it was pretty beautiful. Uh, what part of David Benjamin Tomlinson is in Linus? And is there any part of Linus <laughs> inside of him? I've learned so much from Linus. <laughs> I've learned so much from Linus. You know, uh, we were, what we were talking about earlier in the, in the interview about, um, sometimes feeling socially awkward or, or, or whatever. Um, I feel like that's something that I have in myself or feeling like not quite a part of things. Uh, feeling like an outsider. Um, I feel like that's uh, something that I've judged in myself or feel so I kind of can feel negative uh, in myself. Like, oh, I wish you fit in better or whatever. And when I started playing Linus and I started spending time, I noticed that Linus uh, was awkward as well, but that he held his awkwardness in this really confident way. Like, yes, I, you know, like uh, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard not to, when I, I just want to go into uh, going to him. I don't think you could legally do that. CBS will sue us. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not gonna. Uh, but it's it's like he he's like he the essence of the character for me is like he holds his awkwardness and his unusualness and his uniqueness in in a very confident way. And I was like, oh, and it's possible to do that. I don't have to sort of like feel insecure about the fact that maybe like I talk about the cauliflower paradigm when we're talking about an important thing. Like I can just. Uh, and so that's something that I'm working on as a result of playing the character. So I think he has some of my awkwardness. I think he has some of my loyalty because I am a Leo. I'm very loyal to my friends and family and very protective. So I think he has those qualities. Um, uh, and there's a there's a real elegance to him. And I don't know that that's mine, but there's also a <laughs> weird elegance. I've learned from him, like the to be confident about my own insecurities about fitting in or being au feeling awkward uh, one, but uh, the teleporter episode in the third season where he, the thing that I loved so much about that storyline um, is first of all, I love that the writer uh, chose to kind of like just comment on the fact that we're not all easy adapters to technology. Like sometimes every time that there's an app update or like, it's fun to think that all of our heroes were in the future and everyone's going to adapt easily. But I think it's really, really great to kind of like point out that we not, we don't all like every time if there's an Instagram update or whatever, it's just like, what, how does this work? What is this feel? You know, there's that moment. And I, I love that that was represented on the show. What I also love uh, in terms of Linus in that episode is that he just didn't give up. Like he, we've all walked in that door at the wrong moment or sat in the chair that we shouldn't have sat in and been like, oh, and it's so tempting when those sort of like, you know, embarrassing things happen, we get shut down and we feel like I, I shouldn't try anymore. That was, 
but he doesn't stop trying. He just keeps working. And then ultimately he figures it out. In my mind, there was a scene that we didn't see, you know, where he ends up where he needs to go. And he's like, oh, I understand this now because I kept trying. And so like, since I shot that episode, there have been moments where I'm just like, something's gone, like, ugh. And I'm like, oh, you know what? Just no, keep trying. I think especially now we're so results driven as a as a people right now and like it, it has to be perfect out of the gate and it, and it just isn't sometimes a lot of the time and it's tempting to be like well if this didn't go right then I'm not going to do it and it's like yeah you have to keep trying and there's no shame in keeping trying and so I love I love the experience of getting that kind of insight from him I mean there's kind of that classic thing in sci-fi and especially in Star Trek where the alien is the outsider who's looking in and eventually he does learn to basically find his way in and become accepted and uh, I think especially for a lot of LGBT folks might be listening and say I mean a lot of them will relate to a character like Linus or other similar alien types because they're trying to find themselves and they're trying to find acceptance too I mean have you found that as part of your process? I, as a as a person, I have you know since I came out, I am a big proponent of uh, finding your tribe. So I find my tribe everywhere I go, and I have ended up on this show that is filled with people uh, on my tribe. It is a an, an amazing gift. And uh, as far as Linus goes, um, he he uh, the crew embraces him. Like the crew absolutely accepts and embraces him, and so he which is why I think he holds it in so, uh, his sort of like quirks and such confidence because he knows he's utterly uh, respected and and ma- admired and enjoyed by the crew. And so both Linus and I have found our tribes in the Star Trek universe. And that is a, a huge blessing too. All right. So David, last question for the day. And I think you kind of answered this maybe at the start of the show, but what is the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? What is the best thing? There is I, there is no one best thing. It is the best thing. Being a part of the Star Trek universe is the best thing. Absolutely. Good answer. And, and it's so great to get the chance to meet you. You've been so fan friendly. I'm glad you got a chance to hang out with a lot of fans not that long ago. Uh, hopefully I get to meet you at one of these events too sometime. It would be awesome. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. I, it's always, I, uh, you know, like this is, it's good to meet this way, but I much prefer like the whole in person, hello, and then hopefully soon there won't be plexiglass and masks and it can be just a really human again. I look forward to having a human experience with Linus. Uh, so <laughs> thank you so much for sharing all your great stories and thank you for being so open with us here because I know this probably wasn't the interview you were expecting for a, a Star Trek show, but thank you for being willing to chat about so many different things too. You know what? I'm 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 happy to chat about anything. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to talk about um, all of the pieces of me that go into uh, this character and also just like my history because I know... Uh, it's important, uh, again, representation, right? And experience Absolutely. and it's important. So thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you in season four of Discovery. Yes. Yay! <laughs> and that was our chat with David Benjamin Tomlinson, a supremely talented performer whose skills we've only seen a little bit of in Star Trek so far. Obviously, David couldn't tell us anything about season four, but I look forward to seeing more of Linus in the very near future. Well, technically Discovery Season 4 is actually like way in the very far distant future, but you know what I mean. The history of the Saurian in Star Trek is not a very long one. As we mentioned, the species debuted in 1979 with the first film, where we saw two of those aliens serving on board the Enterprise. In film and television, we wouldn't see any Saurians again until Discovery, and more recently, we also saw one on Lower Decks in the episode No Small Parts, where they were serving aboard Riker's USS Titan. Non-canonically, a Saurian has served on the Enterprise E, named Razka, who was a security officer on the ship. And there was also Bazell, who was a captain of the Federation vessel, the USS Rhea. Both these characters appeared in the Star Trek books, but if you can't get enough of these little guys, you can also play as a Saurian in Star Trek Online. And as for their Saurian brandy, we're actually gonna talk more about that in upcoming episodes, so stay tuned to hear about that. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Trek Untold, which is just one word in all those platforms. If you're listening to this on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or any of those other locations, please leave a positive review and a five-star rating if you can to help show other listeners how much you like this podcast and spread the word. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel at youtube.com slash nerdnewstoday. If you're enjoying Trek Untold and in a position to financially support the show, I hope you consider being one of our Patreon supporters by visiting patreon.com slash trekuntold, 
where you can help us out for as low as $2 a month and get some pretty sweet perks. Shout out once again to Triple Fiction Productions, who you can check out at triple-fictionproductions.net. If you're a collector of Star Trek toys in any size or scale or enjoy prop replicas, you're going to love the quality of their 3D printed products, and I'm sure you will be a repeat customer. If you have any comments, feedback, or suggestions for future guests, send an email to me at trekuntold at gmail.com. I hope you'll beam up again with us next week for another episode of Trek Untold. So until then, I'm Matthew. Thanks for listening, and remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the RageWorks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.